Today on Health Talk, we're looking at the inner working of our digestive system. This includes having problems such as constipation, piles, and continue our discussion up to a stage where colon cancer develops. It's still a situation whereby you have to explain yourself to people. I try to accept it because it's part of me. Yeah. Like sometimes I wish it wouldn't have been me like I was normal, yeah. but I have to. And it's actually interesting because now you know those things on the outside, you know what is happening to your body. The gastrointestinal or digestive tract is that hollow passage that extends from the mouth to the anus. This helps digest our food, absorb all the necessary nutrients from the food we eat, and get, a, get rid of that waste on the other side. We feel good when the system works well. However, that good feeling can quickly disappear when things go wrong. So today we take a look at what can go wrong with the digestive tract. We will discuss ulcers, indigestion, constipation, pars, and colon cancer. I'm Dr. Salom Daoum, and this is Health Talk. The primary functions of a digestive system are the breakdown of food called digestion and the absorption of nutrients into our bodies. The food is then swallowed through the throat into the oesophagus. During swallowing, the nasal and air passages are closed to prevent food accidentally entering into our noses and windpipe. Once in the stomach, the food is mixed with more enzymes and hydrochloric acid to help with finer digestion. The stomach wall helps to churn the food around and finally turn it into a fluid-like material called chyme. Chyme then leaves the stomach to enter the small intestine. The small intestine is the area where absorption of all nutrients takes place. It consists of three parts, the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. Bile from the liver and other digestive enzymes from the pancreas helps with further digestion of the food before absorption of nutrients such as glucose into the blood system. From the small intestine, the food remains or waste products then enters the large intestine or colon, which consists of six parts. As the food remains passes from the cecum, water and salt are absorbed from the chyme, turning it into a stool or feces. Stool or feces is stored into the rectum until one gets the sensation or urge to empty the rectum, where the stool and finally leaves the body through the anus or anal canal. That knowing pain you may be experiencing between or after meals may in fact be peptic ulcer disease. Now, peptic ulcer disease is a very common condition affecting millions of people. Now, we welcome our special guest, Dr. Sam Kasumba, who will help us understand this condition. Dr. Dr. Sam Kasumba is a general surgeon at the Brentest Hospital. Welcome to Health Talk, Dr. Kasumba. Thank you and good morning, sir. All right. Now, we're discussing obviously common conditions affecting the... Um, gastrointestinal tract or what we normally want to refer to as the GI tract. Now, perhaps before we even start talking about peptic ulcer disease, do you want to just take us through the normal anatomy? What is, what is this GI tract that we're talking about? We believe that it, it can be as long as, uh, you know, what, 12 meters long or something? Yes, um, the GI system yeah. starts from the mouth. Yeah, we can actually refer to the, yeah. And... Um, <coughs> When you swallow, um, unfortunately, the mouth is not shown in this. Yeah. But this is the esophagus, which transmits the food down into the stomach. Okay. So it's the food pipe that goes from the mouth into the stomach, yeah? Oh, oh yes. And right. then from the stomach, you know, mixing with acids takes place and breaking down the food into smaller particles. Yeah. For it to be ready to go through into the small intestine where digestion takes place right and then digestion takes place and in the first part of the small intestine and as you go down then absorption takes place right uh, until once the, the absorption is over what is left goes into the colon so that okay. is waste Okay, so, so all the absorption goes, it takes place in the small intestine, as, sure. as you show it in the middle, yes. and what's basically in our colon is actually waste. We don't need that. That is your waste. Okay. Or drainage system. Right. Okay, and then from colon, of course, 
there's one function which the colon does is to absorb whatever water okay. is necessary. Right. And the contents will become more solid as you move up, down, down to the left, col left colon. Yeah. And then by the time you reach the rectum, okay. the feces are solid. Oh, so the rectum is that last part of the colon just before the anus? Yes. And All that's right. the store. And okay. Whenever it is filled up, then you dip comes out through the anus. Okay, the anus. so it's quite a quite a process, quite a long process. Yeah. Now, peptic ulcer disease. Tell us about this. What what is what is an ulcer? An ulcer is is a sore. Yeah. In either the stomach or the duodenum. Okay. That's so it's just a small sore either in the stomach or or. Part of the intestine called the duodenum. The duodenum. Now, yes. can it can it occur behind the in the esophagus, for instance? Yes, under extreme conditions, if there is excessive acid right. from the stomach and right. it goes into the esophagus, which we call reflux, you can have ulcerations there, uh, and okay. that we call it acid reflux disease. Okay, okay, because okay. that's also quite a common one. Hey, we, we, we often hear about this, you know, people talking about reflux, reflux, reflux. Now, in terms of the symptoms, um, if it's a sore, I'm sure it must be painful. How, how does it normally present? Well, the commonest presentation is pain right. in the upper part of your, the body, the right. tummy, or we call the epigastrium. Right. And, but it can present in other ways, vomiting, Right. Or just uh, dyspepsia, that means whenever somebody eats food, it yeah. feels discomfort. And yeah. uh, Well, let's, you know, let's, let's, I think it's important that people understand this, this world. You're saying that if you have pain in the epigastrium or the region just below the end of your chest, yes. that may be indicative of, of an ulcer. But oftentimes, people talk about heartburn. How do you differentiate then between the pain that people normally get, you know, behind the chest and that which they get there. I mean, how do you differentiate between the heartburn and ulcer pain? Unfortunately, it, there's no clear... Yeah, um, the two can coexist in the same, right. in the same patient. Right. And sometimes patients describe heartburn, what one means by heartburn. Yeah. Another one may be something else. But heartburn is that burning sensation when somebody is swallowing. Right. It feels like a hot ball yeah. or hot grenade going through the and lower part no, of the chest. It's got nothing to do with the heart. I wonder why, no, no. why, why, why reference to the heart? Because the esophagus is very close to the heart. Okay. And in fact, in some cases, it may be actually misdiagnosed as a, a okay. heart attack. All right. Yeah. So peptic ulcer disease then. You, you say that you have pain and some people can vomit. So how can one know definitively that, you know, one has a peptic ulcer? Well, the patient has to present himself to, to the practitioner with right. the symptoms. Right. And, uh, of course, the history is taken. Uh, there are predisposing factors. Is yeah. this patient smoking? Yeah. Is this patient been taking uh, some drugs like uh, non-steroid and, and you know non-steroidals for arthritis? Yeah. So so those are basically things some, that can cause ulcers. That can aggravate ulcers. Okay. And then the the investigations will follow suit. And what we do these days, yeah, uh, patient presenting with. Ulcer-like symptoms. Yeah. Gets a gastroscope. That okay. is, you put a camera through the mouth. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to the, yeah, the yeah. causes, because I'd, I'd like us to come back to differentiate between causes and aggravating yeah, factors. Sure. Yeah. But let's, you, you're talking about something very interesting now, a gastroscope. Yes. Some people, you know, if you tell them about a gastroscope, you know, they might even kick you, if, if anything else, because it is said to be some very uncomfortable thing where you forced to swallow a pipe. Tell us about it. Yes, it is, uh, I think it's a very uncomfortable feeling, but yeah. um, not painful, just yeah. uncomfortable. All right. It is a soft tube right. 
almost as soft as a snake yeah. and it goes through the, the patient swallows it and yeah. once it goes through the upper part of the of the of the airway yeah. then the next is quite smooth okay. so it's basically a camera that looks in there to see whether or not you know there's a sore yeah it sees right from the top yeah. until the second part of the duodenum Okay. And you look at lesions, you can see sores, you can see inflammation, yeah. you can see that reflux, yeah. and it, you can also pick up other lesions like cancers like cancers in as the well. stomach. All right, let's yes. go back to, to causes, because you know, I'd like, if somebody watching this program would, would, would say, oh, this can be quite a dangerous thing. Um, yes. w what causes ulcers? Um, these days, the accepted uh, cause is a bacteria yeah. called Helicobacter pylori. Yeah. So you're basically saying this is an infection. It is an infective process. Right. Um, but uh, we know that this bacteria causes the stomach to produce more acid. Right. And it causes gastritis, that's inflammation of the stomach. Right. So it is centered to the causation of ulcers. Okay. But of course, there are other other uh, factors like excessive acid secretion. Some right. individuals, you know, do secrete more acid than others. Right. So we, f we call them hypersecretors. Yeah. These tend to have um, more predisposed to ulcers. Okay, so, so the so-called smoking, alcohol, uh, spicy foods, those are things that aggravate ulcers but don't necessarily cause ulcers is that they what you're saying are, they are they are more of aggravating factors okay but right. then there are other factors like redu reduction in the protection of the stomach layer you yeah. know there are conditions which may lead to that yeah let's say patients who are stressed in or intensive care they yeah. tend to have what we call stress ulceration because ah. there is reduced blood supply. So even psychological stress can cause increased acid production? I hope so, because they say business people tend to have more <laughs> ulcers. Yeah. But I think yeah. any stress can lead to, yeah. to increased acid secretion. Okay. We're running out of time, but just in terms of prevention now and treatment, how can people you know, sort themselves out when they have this, this kind of pain? Yeah, they have to to subject them to a practitioner yeah. and the necessary investigations done. Yeah. And the treatment is mainly medical, medical treatment. treatment. Okay. Uh, they are a combination of medications which I may want to All go right. through. Okay. We'll, we'll come back to that yeah. because we need to just go for a quick break. But when we return, we now look at indigestion and constipation. Please stay tuned. PlayStation 4 remote play and up to two days battery life. Don't settle for good. Demand great. The new Sony Xperia Z3 series. Get the new Sony Xperia Z3 on a My MTN Choice 100 contract for only $4.99 and get a free 12-month music streaming subscription. smartphone takes superior photos even in low light has PlayStation 4 remote play and up to two days battery life don't settle for good demand great the new Sony Xperia Z3 series
So how often have you felt discomfort in your tummy, especially after meals? Do you sometimes struggle with constipation and wondered why? Well, let's get expert advice from our special guest, Dr. Sam Kasumba. Dr. Kasumba, you know, earlier on we were talking about how you treat this pain uh, from ulcers. But sometimes this pain and discomfort may not necessarily be related to ulcers. There's often this loose term. I, I'm not sure if I'm correct in you know, labeling it as, as a loose term called indigestion. What is indigestion? I think, to me, indigestion is a layman's terminology. Right. Because it's what a patient feels. Yeah. Maybe after eating, yeah. may think that he's not digesting. But of course, yeah. I'm thinking about it in what could be cause of indigestion. Yeah. Uh, if somebody has got a complicated ulcer which blocks the stomach outlet, yeah. then this patient, when he eats, the food does not go through the, from the stomach to the inter small intestines. Right. So they, they vomit what they call undigested food. I think this is one part of indigestion, one okay. cause of indigestion. But as often the, the people will tell you, you know, I, I've just had a meal, but I'm just not feeling well. My tummy is just not feeling well. It's not painful, but it's, I'm, you know, sometimes they may say, I feel a little bit nauseous, but it's, I'm just not feeling well. Yes. What actually is going on in there? The, that means that there's irritation in the stomach, right? But some patients might have other conditions like pancreatitis, which causes pain yeah. when on eating. Right. So indigestion is an indication that there's something happening in the what we call the upper gastrointestinal tract right. and has to be investigated okay. accordingly. Right, yes. right, right. Now, oftentimes, you know, we, we, we mentioned, obviously, somebody with ulcers having to go and consult a doctor. Yes. But people buy over-the-counter medication to say, I've got this discomfort or heartburn or I'm just not feeling well, I'm going to buy stuff. Your advice? My advice is that that's a temporary solution, yeah. especially if you can't see a doctor immediately. Right. But I would advise that patient to visit his or her practitioner because yeah. what you may think is an ulcer could yeah. be something else. Especially and if, it's, if it's recurring. Recurrent it's and has to be investigated yeah. accordingly. All right. Now let's move on to a, another interesting, for me, I think, you know, subject. Uh, that of constipation. How do we define constipation? Because oftentimes, you know, people uh, have different ways of defining it. What's the correct way? What is, what is constipation? To me, since a human being eats daily, yeah. there must be some ex excretion every day. Yeah. If that pattern doesn't take place and he eats and then he only evacuates after two, three days or so, I'm saying that is constipation. But hang on. Well, this is, this is quite interesting now. You, so, so, so you're saying, because, and why I'm saying this is interesting is because some people will then say, you know, it's normal for me to have bowel action once every two days, that kind of thing. So you're saying that borders on that, constipation. That person is constipated because right. he had, it does not have normal bowel activity. So what is normal bowel activity then? Once a day, at least? At least once a day, because you are eating, yeah. and then something must come out. Yeah. Yes. All right. So there should be a bowel action at least once a day. But is it only... I mean, does it only refer to the frequency with which you go to the toilet to relieve yourself? Or does it matter about you know, the consistency of your stools? Uh, of course, the, the longer the one takes to go to the toilet, yeah. the more the stools become harder because right. the colon absorbs water from the stools. Right. So if they stay there longer, yeah. there will be more absorption, so the stools will be hard okay. like stones. So, so, so the, the, what causes pain and discomfort is hard, bulky stools that people find difficult to push out. And also the, the stools, because they are packing the rectum, they are stretching yeah. 
the the walls yeah i think that stretch mechanism can cause pain okay. as well right. let's talk about what what causes this kind of thing then uh, you know people to have constipation um the commonest problem is dietary yeah. and uh, i always tell my patients that constipation is more of an urban problem an urban problem yeah. because yeah. When people get urbanized, they, yeah. they tend to eat less vegetables. Okay. Um, so it, most of the patients have constipation because of not eating enough fiber in their diet. Mm. That's the commonest cause. Right, right. And once you address that, the constipation will get better. But of course, there are other conditions which may mimic constipation. I think... Patient, especially after the age of 50, yeah. if there's constipation, you not only think of diet, but you may think of other new growths in the colon, like mm. cancer in the colon. Sure. Yes. What are the problems with constipation? I mean, can it cause any, any major problems? Yes. First of all, it may cause that abdominal pains, yeah. which, are, which we may call as non-specific abdominal pains. Mm. And, you know, because of increased pressure in, into the system, yeah. you can have other problems like, you know, piles, or we call piles. them hemorrhoids. We're going to talk about piles. Just, just hold it there. And, and maybe before we, we, you know, we talk about piles in the next one, let's talk about how people can relieve themselves when they have constipation. What's the best way of treating constipation? The best way of treating constipation is increase your fiber intake. Eat a lot of vegetables and so it's fruits. So uh, prevent it in the first place? Yes, okay. uh, and adequate water intake daily. Okay. So those that already have constipation, what can they do? Uh, it depends. If they are young, you can actually advise on diet, but if they are older, you go to investigate them for other possible underlying causes. So basically go to your doctor? Go to your doctor. Mm, all right. All right, after the break, we now look at what we just spoke about, piles or hemorrhoids. Please stay with us. journey of some of South Africa's greatest citizens. When I wake up in the morning, I've got a challenge. You succeeded in getting me to do something which is absolutely against my nature. If I do something, I do something properly. In celebration to 20 years of democracy, the newly released book 21 Icons offers exclusive access to a remarkable spread of South African legends. It tells their personal stories and unique portraits that reflect our country and above all, it's people. That's Kaleidoscope, Sundays, 5.30 p.m. on SABC News. Coming to you live from our Auckland Park studios in Johannesburg, South Africa. Welcome to AM News on SABC News. We are on DSTV channel 404. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. We'll be taking you through all the developing stories, all the leading stories in South Africa, in the continent of Africa and the rest of the world. The power utility has attributed the current wave of load shedding to what it has described as unforeseen technical problems at current power stations. ESCOM has warned that there is a risk of a total blackout if consumers do not use electricity sparingly. We must work together uh, to make this world better for all. This is what the Nelson Mandela uh, told us. He taught us a very important lesson. That's AM News, daily at 10 a.m. on SABC News. Now, anybody who's suffered from piles before will tell you that this is probably the worst condition you can ever have in your life. 
Now, to learn more about this condition, we still have Dr. Kasumba. Dr. Kasumba, we spoke earlier about piles and what causes piles. Maybe, maybe let's just talk now about how piles can be managed. Uh, piles, the, the management will, de will depend on the degree, but uh, in general, one has to address the, the fiber intake. Yeah. But then, you know, if they get more complicated, more painful bleeding, you can have some operative techniques yeah. to do. But, well, you know, we, we talk about management, and I assume that it is easy. It is something easy that anybody can, can see, and it's easily diagnosable. Correct? Well, the diagnosis is quite easy, but right. of course, as I said, you've got to rule out other problems. Yeah. You so so for, for, for the, just for the sake of our viewers now, when would you know that you have pulse? When you have stool on, on your, when you pass stools, when you're passing stools with blood, or when you wipe a toilet paper, yeah. and then there's blood on it, that's the first thing. That's so the first thing is, is, is bleeding? Then they yeah. start popping out, you okay. know, whenever you go for defecation. Right. And then they return. But as, they, as the time goes on, they don't reduce. Right. Then they become painful, swelling yeah. ab out of the anus. All right. Yeah. Okay. So back to management. Now we said you, you know, it obviously depends on the severity. Let's, let's then just say that it's mild piles, these ones that pop in and out. Your best way to manage those? I would just advise the patient to increase fiber intake and take a lot of water. A lot of water? Yes. What is a lot of water? How many liters a day? At least a liter of water, on top of the other fluids you're taking. Right. There. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, people talk about stuff that they go and buy from the pharmacy. Uh, there's uh, sub suppositories, yeah. there's ointments and what have you. What's, what's your advice there? Rather go and see the doctor or can you go and... You know, to speak to your local pharmacist. How do you? What's the best way to do it? I with think this? you can use it as a temporizing measure, but go and see your doctor. And yeah. Because what you may think is piles or hemorrhoids it may be something else. Yeah. Which needs other approaches. Okay. But sometimes you know, there's talk of people having to undergo an operation. Tell us about it. Yes, it's an operation to disconnect those piles. Right. What, what does that mean, disconnect the piles? Well, piles are, you know, just uh, blood cushions right. into the, in the inner canal. Right. So, and that's where the problem comes from. So, you can actually ligate yeah. where the feeding vessels are. Yeah. Some people cut them out completely, but that's a very painful operation yeah. after that. So you, but they, they you, are treatable. They are treatable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But as I said before, you go to address the diet of yeah, the patient. Yeah. Even Prevention after, is better than cure. Even the after others. treatment, yeah. even after surgery, you go to make sure that the patient does not go back to constipating ways. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it, it must be very, I mean, uh, can people who've had operation for piles live normal lives or do they suffer from a lot of uh, problems? Well, some might, most of them live normal lives, but there could be some complications. All right. Yeah. Okay. Now, is cancer of the colon caused by a diet or not? What we find out of the, after the break. Please stay with us. Nicely dressed, <laughs> PAC colors, you are not in agreement. Why was the president not allowed to address conference? Even when he was given an opportunity, he did not stand up and say, look, I don't recognize this conference. Why didn't you do and, that, uh, Mr. Petty? I was never given any opportunity to speak there. Mr. Petty cannot come to the studio and com complain about what transpired in the conference. <laughs> did you say, Banna, I will pay for the PAC? When time comes for you to pay back the money, 
you will pay me back. Yes, he is lying. Yeah. Bring. That money this, is mine and I did not get it back. This information. And I want it this even information now. Is He's a deputy there. They took 480,000 <laughs> without me. He said he's the general secretary. He's the accounting officer. Where on earth can the general secretary be the accounting officer? <laughs> yeah? He's 40 <laughs> We'll come back. Watch Question Time with me, Mpote. Monday to Thursday at 5.30 p.m. on the SABC News Channel. Melang Kunjani Nda Salamulekam Hoyamore Namaste Jumbo Africa and a very warm welcome to SABC News Channel 404. South African Revenue Service has upheld its impressive record of collecting taxes. South has collected about 86 billion rand more in the fiscal year compared to the previous year. The message we want to communicate is that government must also live modestly and uh, that when we're looking at these sorts of issues, uh, modesty is an important message to, to communicate uh, to, to the public. That's AM News, daily at 10 a.m. on SABC News. Colorectal cancer is a disease in which cancer cells form in the wall of the colon or rectum. The lifetime risk of developing colorectal cancer in South Africa is 1 in 98 for men and 1 in 150 for women. Although the exact cause is not known, the risk of colorectal cancer gets higher as age advances beyond 50 years. Lifetime factors that increase the risk of developing colorectal cancer include lack of regular exercise, low intake of fruits and vegetables, low fiber and high fat foods, overweight and obesity, alcohol intake or smoking. You are also at risk for colorectal cancer if you have personal or family history of inflammatory bowel disease intestinal polyps, cancer of the colon, rectum, ovary, endometrium of breast cancer. Most people do not experience any signs and symptoms, but the following may indicate possibility of colorectal cancer. Changes in the frequency of your bowel movements, including diarrhea and constipation. Narrow stools, stools thinner than normal, blood in your stool, blood may be bright red, dark colored, or black, and terry looking, persistent pain or discomfort, frequent abdominal pain, gas pains, cramps, or bloating, a feeling that bowels don't empty completely, unexplained fatigue, unexplained weight loss, nausea or vomiting. Colorectal cancer goes through several stages from stage 0 where the cancer is contained to only the innermost lining of the colon or rectum to stage 4 where the cancer has spread to most parts of the body. 30% of all colorectal cancers can be prevented through changing lifestyles. Early detection is vital for survival. It is therefore advisable that if you are over the age of 50 years and or are at high risk, you visit your doctor for screening. This is either through testing your stools for presence of blood or undergoing a procedure called colonoscopy. If a cancer is detected through screening and confirmed, it is not the end of the world. There are various treatment methods available and these include surgery, radiotherapy or chemotherapy. Cancer of the colon is the second most common cancer worldwide. As with all cancers, it can be completely treatable only if detected early. 
Let's find out more from the experts. We still have Dr. Kasumba with us, but we're now joined by Dr. Devon Moodley, who's a specialist medical oncologist uh, in private practice in Johannesburg. And we also have Sister Togo Kuliwe, who's a stoma therapist. Welcome to Health Talk. Thank you. Thank you. Now, mm. very quickly, maybe let's start with you, Dr. Kasumba. Tell us about colon cancer or colorectal cancer. What, what is colorectal cancer? Colorectal cancer is uh, malignant in the colon and rectum, that part of the intestine yeah. called the colon. Okay, so it's cancer that affects the colon and, and the rectum. Yes. And who, who gets this type of cancer? I think anybody can get that, this cancer. Right. But there are people who are more at risk of getting that yeah. cancer. For example, people who have had ongoing constipation for a long time, yeah. they are more at risk of getting colon cancer. Yeah. People who have fa relatives who have had So colon family cancer, history is also history an is very, issue there, yeah? Very, yeah? And people who have had a colon cancer treated, yeah. they can develop another cancer yeah. in the colon in another area. Yeah. And then there are other conditions where if patient has got what we call a polyp, that's a, a, a growth which may not be malignant. Yes. This, if un, unchecked, yes. as it grows bigger, it turns into colon cancer. Okay. Now, very briefly, I mean, somebody watching this program would want to know, how can I avoid getting this cancer, or, or what can I do to ensure that it's, it's picked up early? Well, unfortunately, I think about 60% of colon cancers are sporadic. So it's, in other words, you would not know. Mm -hmm. You may not have a family history yeah. or any other predis predisposing factors. Yeah. But of course, any adult who is above 50 years yeah. and has got some you know, risk factors should go for a checkup. Yeah. What do you do in the checkup? There's what we call screening. Yeah. That is, if somebody has no symptoms at all, yeah. uh, but he's, he, come, he comes from that group of high-risk factors right. which we talked about. Yeah. But if there are symptoms like uh, bleeding yeah. through the anus, yeah. constipation, yeah. and sometimes swelling or bloating, what we, the patients may call bloating. Okay. Let's, let's invite Dr. Devon Moodley now. Dr. Devon, we... We've heard about, you know, colon cancer and so on. Let's talk about treatment, because you're involved now in treating people that have cancer. Please tell us about it. Actually, the first person usually that's involved in the treatment of this disease, Dr. Kusumba will tell you, is the surgeon. Right. So usually, not all the time, but usually the diagnosis is made by the surgeon. Yeah. And the usual thing in this scenario is to first cut it out. Right. See, because the colon is a tube yeah. and a long tube, yeah. it's easy to cut, cut, and join. Okay. Right? Yeah. So colon cancer is usually a disease that's initially treated by the surgeon. And only after that, if the primary practitioner is worried that there are one or two things in that whole clinical scenario yeah. that makes him think that this patient is at risk of this disease, coming back somewhere else, right. that that kind of patient comes to see a doctor like me. Okay. Let's, Dr. Moodley, Dr. Sean Moodley now spoke about a tube cutting, and we end up with something like a colostomy bag. Mm -hmm. Tell us about what you do, Sister Okay. Kalu. Colostomy bags, um, initially when the patient is going for colostomy or stomach construction, yeah. the patient will be referred to stomach clinic yeah. or seen by stomach team, yeah. whereby we're going to do the pre counseling yeah. and we initialize our discharge plan. Yeah. With initializing our discharge plan, we're going to talk about uh, the type of bag, yeah. And we'll be citing the patient as well. So basically training the patient I, on how to look after that's the colostomy it, bag. Yes. Well, mm. gentlemen and lady, unfortunately we've run out of time. I wish we had more time, but thank you very much for your contribution. Okay. We have Kolanim Velasi and Jasmine van Logeren who are going to tell us their story about them living with a colostomy. I have this colostomy that is permanent. I have to use it for life.
So, so why, why did they say you need a permanent colostomy? Because the left side of my anus muscle is completely damaged. So yeah. to excrete feces, I won't yeah. be able to do that. I won't feel or anything. Right. It will just come. Okay. So I had to get the colostomy. Okay. So you've had this colostomy for... Three years now. Three years now. And it's permanent. Tell us what, what you go through on a daily basis with, with the colostomy. Okay, sometimes it leaks, especially at school it's very difficult to handle. Yeah. Because it will leak and then the class will like make noises and who did that. And for me it's, it's, how can I say now, I don't have enough confidence to handle that. So I would have to be on the side, keeping quiet, knowing that it is me. So it's very difficult. Yeah. But I have to go through it every day, but I get used to it. No. Do you, so so do you like do you like have <coughs> spare bags? How many do you do you have? I get like a box every month. Yeah. Yeah. And and how many do you go through on a daily basis? Do you use one a one day? One a day. Yeah. Not actually a day. I'll yeah. use it for like three days, one bag. Is it? If it leaks or anything then I have to change it. So how do you make sure that it stays clean? I wash it. Wash it. Who, yes. who so who taught you how to you the know, nurses take it hospital, off and, and put it back yeah, and wash the it. The nurses taught me that. Uh -huh. All of it. And and do you go for any checkups, perhaps, to go learn how to do it? No, I learned it the first day yeah. that I was discharged from hospital. They yeah. taught me everything. Is it? Okay, it's been three years now that you've been on this bed, the colostomy yes. bed. And how do you feel now? Still not used to it yet. Yeah. Like, I try to accept it because it's part of me. Yeah. Like, sometimes I wish it wouldn't have been me, like I was normal, yeah. but I have to. And it's actually interesting because now you know those things on the outside, you know what is happening to your body. Right, right. Did you have to change your lifestyle in any way? Not really. Not really. Okay, the way I eat, I have to eat, like, not yeah. a lot of beans or anything like that, so, yeah. yeah. Why did they say you can't eat beans? <laughs> My stomach can't be too... How can I say? It can't be runny and it yeah. can't be like, how can, how can I say? Yeah, constipated. Right. Well, Ani, let's hear your story. What happened to you? Okay, let me take you back. 98, I was doing my trick. It started as a boil yeah. on the left. Fine, went to the doctor. A boil where? On my left shoulder, uh, arm, armpit. Right. right. Right, fine. Went to the doctor. The doctor carried out, went to tertiary, came back again. So as I was progressing through tertiary and like starting to work, they came, they went, they came, and I was just taking an antibiotics, antibiotics. Right. And then up until 2002, 2002, I went to a hospital. The doctors didn't know what the problem was. So my mother and I used to go to, you know, just traditional, just to want to help because there yeah. was nothing, I was losing weight, no one, no one knew. Yeah. Tests were done, AIDS, no one knew, until one doctor said it was hydronitis separativa. Yeah. So what was basically happening at all my sweat glands yeah. were secreting pus. Right. So it was from under arms and then other areas, you yeah. know, where it's warm. Yeah. Right, fine. And uh, let me take you to 2006. That was the only time I was actually hospitalized. Right. Yes, by a gentleman by the name of Dr. Bula Bula. Yeah. This but, was in but, but then you started off by saying, I mean, you only had one boil in I the, had one in boil, your and then the one boil spread. Yeah. And it spread to the to to to, to it started at the right on the on, on the on the left. Right. It went to the right. Right. And then from the right, it went to my my my, my private areas. Yeah. Right. And then from there on, it just went wild. Uh, my face, if you can see, no, but I don't know the close up. Yeah. Yeah. I started coming out from my face also. Yeah. So yeah. Then from there on, I used to go to the doctors. They gave me antibiotics, but it was any nothing was helping. Mm -hmm. Until I was diagnosed. This was 2006. That it was hydronitis separativa. So the only way the, to, to, to help is to cut everything out. Right. Yeah. So they started with the cutting of my skin and uh, stayed in hospital for one year, eight months, just lying and then doing skin grafts. The well, first, let's talk about the, 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 the anal yeah, area. The then. anal area. The yeah. anal area, they had to relocate it because yeah. of the, 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 the soiling. Right. So they had to make sure that I get a bag yeah. because of too much soiling. Yeah. And I wasn't healing, and it, and, and I was not healing. Right. Fine, it was first temporary, but due to complications, I was see, I was I had seizures. The thing is, I was under a lot of pain, so I was they were giving me morphine on a daily basis. So with the morphine, with, and the, and the, and the pills, uh, I was getting seizures all the time. And with the seizures, I ended up secreting. That's why I stayed long in the in, in hospital. Right. I went back again for uh, 
as biopsy or what is it? Yeah. Yeah, they opened me up again and then they said, no, it's permanent for now. We'll see how it goes. Yeah. And then from and this there, is since 2007. This is 2000. This is 2007 right. up until now. Yeah. And uh, living with it, I never accepted it at first because yeah. I thought, okay, fine, I can still change the circumstance. So right. it was difficult psychologically. Right. But the best thing about having people around you that help you, like your family, your friends, yeah. there's a certain understanding. And plus, I've never left confidence-wise. Yeah. So confidence-wise, I was always okay, up and right. up, and always right. cheering other people on. Okay. It was difficult because yeah, relationships and other stuff, it's still a situation whereby you have to explain yourself to people. Yeah. And living in the hood, it's also another problem where right. you have to explain yourself to people. Right. But I realized, you know what, it's my life. So right. I take it as it comes. Mm. You mm. Know, yeah, and, and, and basically now you, could, you, you regard yourself as living a normal life. No, I'm living a normal life. I started jogging since the beginning of the year and I've lost a lot of weight, actually, right. yeah, from, from the person that I was. Dieting and yeah, I'm actually feeling better about myself. Yeah. Tell us yeah. about your diet. What, what, what do you what do you have? Why do you eat? Stay away from milk because yeah. it comes out same time. Beans, yeah. fiber is a problem. Yeah. When you take it, take it moderately. Know that you're not going to be going out anytime soon because it just comes out. But yeah. if ever I'm with family or friends, okay, fine, it's no problem. Right. You know because some people find it uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. But basically, you can eat anything. Yeah. It's just that the only problem is that when you eat certain foods like dairy yeah. products, it comes, it, it comes out as, as, as what you call it, as air. Yeah. But the important uh, message there for the public is, is basically that even if you have a colostomy, you can live a normal life. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for your time. All right, sure, sir. Great stuff. Sure, sir. Thank you. Well, sadly, that's how we come to the end of our show today. And remember, you can join us again next week, same time, on SABC News. And you can watch the repeat shows at 2 p.m and 10 p.m. tonight. Otherwise, you have the option, of course, of getting our show on YouTube. So, from me, Dr. Salomon Taung, and the rest of the team, thank you for watching. Happy holidays.